welcome to another episode of the Murder Murder News podcast. These weekly episodes double as weekly meetings for our very own true crime cult. But don't worry, you've stumbled into the cult with all the cool matching outfits and none of the calorie counting. We just like to imagine a secret hideaway where we can camp out with our spooky friends, making flower crowns, roasting marshmallows, and sharing our best scary stories about the subject that unites us all, murder. I'm Angelina, and today I'm hanging out with my sinister sister, Aurora. How was your week? It was very good, a little spooky. Nice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a healthy dose of spooky, I hope. A healthy, healthy <laughs> dose of spooky. <laughs> nice. You had uh, a spooky Valentine's Day, maybe? Did you do anything cool? Uh, yeah, not much for Valentine's Day, but I did go mm. on the ghost tour mentioned last oh, week here yes. in Croatia, which was right. um, just fantastic. If if anyone ever happens to be in Dubrovnik for vacation, uh, I definitely recommend looking up Haunted Dubrovnik. It's the definitely the only ghost tour place in Dubrovnik. Uh, wow. And she's just great. Uh, her name is Maria and the tour starts in a cemetery and mm. it goes into like, um, of course, like their haunted history. There's um, mm-hmm. uh, like fake uh, Russian princesses hiding away that are like mm-hmm. maybe haunting this place from the 1700s mm. where like the French had come and there's like all these like tie-ins, all these historical events. Um, so you get like a little bit of that, like in yeah. Dubrovnik's history of Napoleon invading and like whatever. Sounds like fancy ghosts. <laughs> yeah. There's some fancy ghosts, mm. but then there's like mm. these like great stories about their folklore. They have like this weird thing with like burning a single candle and like carrying it around mm. and it like filters its way into a lot of their stories about like creepy haunting like things like seeing nuns like marching with candles there's like tons of weird things like that and like mythical creatures witch gallows um and mm. then because the city's so old there's like plague mass burial sites and just like all mm. kinds of like random weird things it's just amazing wow. and she does a great job she scared me like full on screaming twice. <laughs> oh, wow, that's intense. That's yes. like a, a, a glowing review for a ghost tour, I've got to say. She's and fantastic. like, I'm impressed how many cool historical moments and how many um, ghosts they can cram into one um, small city where there's like, you know, bigger places that don't have as much going on. It's yeah. just like the, the, the amount of history, how old these places are, they're just like really thick with it. There's amazing. Like so much time in their history for ghosts. Mm, <laughs> there yeah. must be so many. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. How about you? How about your week for Valentine's Day? Uh, we didn't do anything particularly special. We had a, you know, a little champagne and, and stayed inside. It's nice. um, ridiculously cold at the moment. We're like in oh, a no. weird swing where it's... Uh, Today, like, feels like minus 30 degrees, and then tomorrow is supposed to be above zero, and then the day after that is minus 30 again. So uh, oh all gosh. throughout that, we're going to get rain and snow. Ugh. It's going to be very fucking weird. So, like, I'm just trying not to be outside because, uh, yeah, everything's going to be coated in ice, I guess. So just uh, finishing my hibernation, my last little month, I guess. Well, um, it's probably best to stay inside in front of you monsters mm. that are <laughs> anywhere near Canada or someplace with yeah. like ice storms and whatever. Ice Just and stay in and hang yeah. out with us. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Much better here. We're, yes. We'll keep you warm. <laughs> and we like to think of all of you as honorary monsters just because you tune into our show week after week. But if you'd like to make things a bit more official, you can join us at the MMN Commune on Patreon. Perks include your very own flashy title like Deacon of Goats, a bit of murder merch so you can proudly display that you're a fan of the show, and of course, exclusive access to our regular Patreon-only content. And this month, um, I was actually quite inspired by a post that you may have seen we made for Valentine's this week about um, one of the things to celebrate instead of Valentine's Day is the death (laughs) of uh, Captain James Cook. Uh, yeah. because he was stabbed in his colonizing neck <laughs> <laughs> on Valentine's yes. Day uh, by yeah. the Native Hawaiians. And um, I thought that sounded amazing. So I've actually been doing a little digging into that history because 
there was like a, a kidnapping plot, like he was going to kidnap the king. And like, there's all these like interesting things about that history. So I think it ties wow. in, uh, you know, like normally, obviously we do like kind of true crime history stuff and that might be not quite in our wheelhouse, but I think there's enough murder and kidnapping plot to make it interesting. So I think I'm going to cover yeah. that. Yeah. Any like weird schemey plots, anything involving, yeah, th- this sounds like a, a story that is surprisingly rife with true crime, but uh, Agreed. <laughs> I'm excited because like, uh, this is the first year that I've seen people really posting about that. So I wasn't super thinking about that every Valentine's day, but now I'm going to, and I'm excited to hear the full story. Yeah. It sounds like something to celebrate. And, uh, yeah. I, I saw this post in the, uh, wonderful Fruit Loops podcast group on Facebook mm. and it's really great. And Wendy and Beth are both active in there. And somebody from that group had posted this meme and that's where we, uh, yoinked it from. And, nice. um, and so somebody had posted like, God, I hope this is true. Like, I hope this isn't just like a funny tweet. And like, sure Mm -hmm. enough, I was at least reading the Wikipedia page. And then I listened to a um, a podcast episode that we'll mention. I can't think of the name, but we'll be sure to mention that in our Patreon episode and give them credit uh, about it. And uh, it's definitely on Valentine's Day. It's real wild and get ready for it. (laughs) Yeah. Perfect for anyone that's crabby about love on that day. Exactly. (laughs) There's something more sinister to focus on. (laughs) This is your new holiday. (laughs) Um, So before we dig into today's story, let's take a look at some true crime headlines from this week. Jerry Harris, the star of Netflix show Cheer, pleaded guilty last week to charges of receiving child pornography and traveling across state lines to engage in illicit sexual acts with a minor under the age of 15. The actor was indicted in December on charges of misconduct in Texas, Illinois, and Florida. Prosecutors allege that Harris tried to persuade minors to engage in sex acts at cheerleading events, and he has admitted to having five to 10 victims. Harris faces up to 50 years in prison and is scheduled to be sentenced in June. Just a weird comment there, like the five to 10 victims. Like, what exactly does he mean? (laughs) Does he not recall? Or like, is he waiting to see how many victims come forward? And like, I'll admit to however many there are. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) that's that's a really good question. And I have not seen the show and I've seen headlines about the story and I haven't really Mm -hmm. done much deep digging. Like it's Mm-hmm. I don't know, like stuff like in this realm of like child molestation and stuff is just like really triggering for me. So like it's... I've just never heard anyone say five to 10 victims. And I'm like, like as admitting to them, like that's a strange admission. It's really very strange. And I know a lot of people were a fan of this show. So I'm sure this yeah. is uh, impacting a lot of people right now, unfortunately. Eight long years ago, News outlets released a story that would have been perfect for one of our Florida Man Friday TikToks. The scene got heated at a Tampa area movie theater as 43-year-old Chad Olson allegedly refused to turn off his phone during the movie. Annoyed by the distraction of the phone screen's glow, 71-year-old retired cop Curtis Reeves went over to scold the man. Olson told Reeves to mind his own business, and when he did not relent, Olson retaliated by tossing popcorn at Reeves. Reeves responded by shooting Chad Olson in the chest, killing him, and severing the finger of Chad's wife, Nicole, who was seated next to her husband in the theater. Yeah. Aside from the usual pandemic-related delays, this case has also been repeatedly disrupted as Reeves tried to evoke Florida's standard ground law. Many believe the controversial law excuses and encourages reckless and unnecessary violence, particularly after the Trayvon Martin trial, where George Zimmerman claimed he felt threatened enough to justify killing the teenager. After some unsuccessful efforts to have the charges against him dropped, Curtis Reeves finally went to trial this week. Prosecutors say the shooting was clearly murder, and with plenty of witnesses as well as surveillance footage, it looks like they may soon get a conviction. Wow, that law seems uh, not so great. Horrible. <laughs> and whew. like, this is how we deal with our problems now. Someone throws popcorn in a movie theater and they get murdered for yeah. it. This mm. is not good. And this, like, I don't know. I mean, 
This reminds me of being from Austin, Texas. There's the infamous yeah. Alamo Draft House, which is a great place to go see movies. And before each mm-hmm. one of their movies, they have kind of like a funny PSA about not using your phone during the movie. <sighs> and yeah. there's like sometimes like they'll have like a celebrity guest come through town for like Fantastic Fest, which they host at um, their theaters or like some other you know, celebrity guests, like whatever. And yeah. like, they have one of like Will Ferrell being like, look guys, like you got to keep your phones <laughs> off and like whatever. And, like, they have all these silly ones. And mm-hmm. um, there was like one that was really funny that they had this woman call in to complain because the staff asked her to leave the movie because she wouldn't keep her phone away. And she kept getting complaints <laughs> about her phone being out. And she left mm-hmm. this like three minute long, like, and you kicked me <laughs> out because I had my phone and I have every right to use my phone in your movie. And like just going on oh and God. on and on. And so they used that as their PSA for like years. It's very it's like, funny. Don't be this person. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> That's that's funny. Yeah, it's clearly super annoying. There's a lot of yeah. annoying things at movie theaters. But um, yeah, I, I am glad when I'm in Canada that I expect no one has guns. Yeah, right. That's Please. not not necessary. No, you don't need to bring a gun into it. Let the staff know. Yeah. I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. We'll be right back after a quick commercial break. Hey, what's up, you guys? I'm Catherine. And I'm Haley. And we are Saturdays Are for the Ghouls, a podcast on the Podmoth Network. We cover all things spooky, like horror movies, true crime, the supernatural, and spooky stories. In the most chaotic way possible. So join your favorite ghoul friends every Saturday, wherever you listen to podcasts. And become a spooky babe! (laughs) So spooky babes, we'll see you in your nightmares! And we're back. Now, before we get into our story, we just want to say that while our tone is light in the intro, we do take the topics we're discussing very seriously. We are best buds and we love chatting together every week and turning it into a podcast. We want to share that passion with you and to create a vibe where all of you feel like our best buds too. We joke about us friends forming a cult or commune, but that's not to diminish the severity of actual cult activity, which we do occasionally talk about in our weekly stories. We feel it's important to open up and talk about even the darkest aspects of humanity and the downright scary things that come up in the news. But we want to make it clear that our intention is never to sensationalize, and we always try to deliver these stories with respect to all parties involved or affected by the crimes we discuss. We always post our sources in the episode description so you can do some digging on your own if a story we present piques your interest. But you should know that if you ever feel we get it wrong, either in our tone or in the details of the case, we want to hear about it. We are more than happy to make a correction or give an update on a case we've discussed in previous episodes. So feel free to reach out to us at murdermurdernews at gmail.com. Some specific trigger warnings for this episode include fat phobia, manipulation, child abuse, torture, and child murder. If any of those subjects are particularly sensitive for you, you may want to skip this one and listen to one of our other episodes instead. Today, we have a story from the subsection of true crime that I find most fascinating, cults. Maybe you already had a personal fascination with cults, or maybe one of our episodes has sent you down a rabbit hole of cult research, Either way, if you know your cults, you're probably already familiar with some of the tactics employed by cult leaders to keep their followers loyal. A lot of othering when they speak about people outside the church designed to isolate church members from non-believers. Oftentimes, new followers are lured by a false sense of inclusivity and support, which slowly morphs into deprivation and an unhealthy dependence on the group or its leader. The cult of the Remnant Fellowship Church was founded on fat phobia and self-deprecation. There was no masking it. Leader Gwen Shamblin openly preached right from the start that God will never love you if you're fat. The church was actually born out of a weight loss workshop that Shamblin started out of her garage in Nashville back in the early 1990s after working as a nutritional consultant since the 80s. In 1997, Gwen Shamblin wrote a book on her diet philosophy called The Way Down Diet. And from there, her movement took off, and she was holding workshops across America and in many other places around the world, including Canada, the UK, and Europe. The workshops were generally held in churches, but some followers in the U.S. would hold meetings in their homes. 
The way down approach is to wait until you feel painful hunger cramps until eating and to stop halfway through every meal. She literally advised her followers to order a half portion at restaurants and take the rest in a doggy bag. Skinniness is next to godliness, according to Gwen. But what do we do about those cravings? Because when you're suddenly cutting out at least half of your calorie intake, you're going to get cravings. Like a lot of addiction recovery programs out there, Gwen suggests replacing your passion for food with a passion for God. Hmm. Mm-mm. Fill your belly. <laughs> <laughs> bread is better. Oh my. <laughs> yes. Bread is at least very good. <laughs> bread, bread is my God. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> It was widely popular because it spoke to the inner voice of self-conscious people. Gwen Shamblin was telling her followers that they are not worthy, that their poor eating habits or fixation with food were ungodly, that they were sinners. This so closely resembles the negative self-talk that goes hand in hand with disordered eating. The gospel, according to Gwen, must have felt comfortable and familiar to many people. And of course, they were eager to find out how to fix themselves. And Gwen had a solution. The way down was just the punishment that self-declared, quote, lost souls were seeking. You heard right, punishment. Right out of the gate, before the Remnant Fellowship Church was founded, and long before anyone labeled it as a cult, Gwen dug right in to depriving her followers and robbing them of whatever shred of self-esteem they may have one day possessed. We know that a very effective method of brainwashing is to deprive people of food or sleep so that they're more vulnerable and more susceptible to BS because the deprivation robs them of rational thought process. Gwen cut straight to the chase with no illusion of empowerment or inclusivity from the start. That's not to say there's no posturing for newcomers to the church. Congregants cultivate a proper image, slender, well-dressed, smiling families with brilliant white teeth. But get this, the act of being overly friendly and welcoming to new and prospective members is actually called love bombing. That's what the followers of the Remnant Fellowship call it. That's their term. And it's a term they share with psychiatrists who use it when describing a common pattern in abusive, controlling relationships. Abusers love bomb their victims by fawning over them, lavishing affection, only as a tactic to influence them or make them dependent. An ex-cult member on Reddit shared her personal experience with the church, which she attended from the time she was a kid. During one of her first church services, this person walked into the church and saw a snack table set up in the lobby. She grabbed a tasty-looking donut and headed to the room where all the other kids had their Sunday school. Another girl turned to this Redditor and said, what are you doing? That's the temptation table. You're not supposed to take that stuff. Oh, my God. Yikes. And just wasting food to boot when there's hungry people. Cool. Right. Once during an interview with Larry King on CNN, Gwen spoke of the Holocaust as part of the inspiration for her diet plan. Oh, no. So cringy. So cringy. Yeah. She said, quote, how in the Holocaust did you have all these people getting down real skinny? They ate less food, end quote. Wow. That is so disgusting. Yeah. What's interesting is that there's no exercise element to the way down plan. Actually, Shamblin scorns exercise, especially for women. Generally, exercise is said to be a selfish act because it focuses on the self rather than focusing on God. Literally 100% of our efforts should be concerned with God, according to Gwen. Self-care is a no-no. If a man were to slip up and get involved with exercising, though, no biggie, because of course Gwen's gospel included a heaping helping of internalized misogyny. Not only do men call the shots, but working out is considered to be a manly pursuit, making women who work out doubly wrong. They're disrespecting God and disrespecting men. The nerve. Mm -hmm. The Way Down Diet sold 1.2 million copies and Shamblin put out two more books. The Way Down Lost program naturally morphed into a religious movement And Gwen Shamblin was from Nashville, which is nicknamed the buckle on the Bible belt. She also possessed a business mindset resembling that of Jim Jones, targeting multiple segments of the market. Gwen's target segments included fat people, submissive wives, authoritarian husbands and fathers, anyone with low self-esteem, and what the heck, why not evangelicals too? The Remnant Fellowship Church was founded in 1999 in Brentwood, Tennessee. 
It was erected on a 40-acre plot of land that Shamblin had purchased, which was a glaring red flag that this movement was growing into a cult. Eventually, people from all over started moving to Brentwood to be with the fellowship, even though there were churches cropping up all over. The church's doctrines appealed to Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, as well as smaller branches of evangelical Christianity, such as the Church of Christ, which Shamblin grew up in. The Remnant Fellowship, however, rejected some of the major tenets of Christianity, namely the idea that Jesus Christ died for our sins. No, nope, you're not getting off that easily. You have to pay for your own sins. That, and you should also just stop sinning. Gwen Shamblin was also not into the idea of the Holy Trinity, as she explained in an email newsletter to her followers back in 2000. This declaration was cause for a bit of controversy in the Christian community, and in response, Shamblin lost some employees, her third book was canceled by the publisher, and a number of churches decided to drop the Way Down program. No big deal. Who needs them? Gwen had her own church now and a growing population of faithful followers. Although she was clearly just capitalizing on Christianity and didn't seem genuinely religious, folks were already indoctrinated and at that point couldn't see the forest for the trees. I think it's important to spotlight the damage that manipulation and emotional abuse can do to the psyche. I want to make it clear that although I have a lot of terrible things to say about the Remnant Fellowship cult, I do have sympathy for its followers who are also victims. I even have some degree of sympathy for the perpetrators of the horrific crime that we're talking about today because I believe they were brainwashed. The bigger a movement like this gets, and the more immersed its followers get in the church community, the easier it is for individuals to get swept up. Whatever it is that everybody's doing in the community becomes the new normal. In particular, children who grow up in a cult may never realize they're in a cult because it's all they've ever known and it seems normal to them. The Bible preaches modesty, and I want to point out something that I read in a tweet this week, that what the Bible is actually saying here is that you shouldn't flaunt your wealth, and it has nothing to do with sexuality or revealing clothing. Gwen Shamblin, though, sure knew how to flaunt her wealth. She either dressed like a debutante or like she was giving a TED Talk, depending on the occasion. She wore about a pound of makeup, and her sky-high hair certainly turned heads. We'll post a picture on Patreon and on our social media because if you don't know Gwen, you've got to see her to believe just how severe her look is. According to some ex-cult members on Reddit, she was also perfectly okay with telling lies. If she needed to spin a few stories to get her point across, she wouldn't stop to think about the Ten Commandments. Telling the truth isn't particularly important as long as you are skinny, submissive, and self-loathing, you'll get to heaven. Gwen Shamblin had been married to David Shamblin since 1978, but according to members of the Remnant Fellowship Church, he rarely made an appearance. In 2018, after 40 years of marriage, Gwen and David Shamblin divorced. Although most comparable religious movements shun divorce, Gwen's mindset seems to be, it's okay if she does it. Gwen quickly married her boyfriend, who she had been seeing for a while before actually getting divorced, Joe Lara. From then on, she was known as Gwen Shamblin Lara. Joe was a musician, a martial artist, and he was best known for playing Tarzan on TV. When I think of Joe Lara, I remember the shirtless shot from the opening titles of the Tarzan TV series, and all I can think is Gwen has finally completed her look with a muscled himbo on her arm. <laughs> Ex-cult members on Reddit also pointed out that the duo were great actors which would come in handy when we get to the true crime portion of our program. Joe Laura was a lot more involved in the church than Gwen's ex-husband, and together the couple would quickly and comfortably defend themselves and their followers in the face of any accusation of wrongdoing, armed with an excuse for everything. This is another skill in the toolbox of any successful cult leader. And it makes sense that they were prepared because when you run a cult like the Remnant Fellowship, there are bound to be some allegations of abuse, particularly because the church preached in favor of corporal punishment. Because as you may recall, quote, a good Christian is submissive. And the best way to encourage submissiveness is through punishment and abuse. You already know about the berating that members of the weight loss program and eventually the church endured from their leader. But Gwen Shamblin Lara 
also asked that her followers get in line with her prescribed hierarchy, which went as follows. God, of course, is at the top. We all must be submissive to God. Next up is Gwen Shamblin Lara, the self-proclaimed prophet. Underneath her is all of the husbands of the congregation. Women must be submissive to their husbands. Then we have mothers and fathers. Children must be submissive to their parents. This reads like a recipe for an everlasting chain of oppression, but cool. Yeah. <laughs> Ex-members say that in religious workshops for women, they were encouraged to submit sexually to their husbands whenever they wanted it. In men's workshops, they were encouraged to go ahead and sexually assault their wives if they wouldn't willingly submit to them. Gross. Yeah. Parents were encouraged to abuse their children, but there's a lot of mincing words anytime anyone tries to hold Gwen Shamblin Lara accountable for this. There are recordings you can find on YouTube, as well as some clips included in the HBO Max show called The Way Down, where you can hear Shamblin Lara telling her followers to hit their children or to lock them up with nothing but a Bible. When confronted, she explains that she does not advocate for parents to hit their children, quote, over and over and over again, end quote, gross. Mm. I don't know how many overs are acceptable in her eyes, but in these interviews, it comes across that Gwen considers a certain level of abuse to be justifiable but that she draws the line at days long torture sessions and hitting kids, quote, just for fun. It should only be done in the name of punishment and submission. In the interviews, what's often discussed is spankings, but let's talk about what a spanking consists of. Gwen has said on recordings that if a child does not fear a spanking, then you aren't hitting him hard enough. And that if you don't spank your children hard enough, then you don't love them. You love yourself, which is discouraged. Many members and ex-members of the cult have stated that the Remnant Fellowship recommends whipping children with glue sticks. What I mean by glue sticks here is the sticks that you put into a larger sized hot glue gun. They're about a foot long and about as big around as a Sharpie. We will include a photo on Patreon too so you'll understand what we mean. The photo that we'll share with you, Monsters, is actually a photo of a mother with her three children at church, and she's holding one of those glue sticks in her hand in the photo. The mother in the photo is Sonia Smith, and hers is the family involved in the criminal case that we are about to unwrap for you. The reason glue sticks are recommended is because they hurt just as much as a switch, but are less likely to leave bruises on your child. Some ex-cult members, as well as some former fundamentalist Christians, spoke of a commonly practiced method called blanket training. Blanket training is when you place your baby or toddler on a blanket, and if they wander over the border of that blanket, you whip them. Being whipped with glue sticks is only one of the several abusive tactics endured by Joseph Smith, a young boy in the Atlanta area whose family attended the Remnant Fellowship Church. Joseph's mother, Sonia, was in a Remnant Fellowship women's group with Gwen Shamblin Lara. We'll be right back. One of the reasons why I've always been attracted to true crime is that I spend a lot of time processing the worst thing that can happen and kind of planning my escape route if I were to be abducted or find myself on a scary Tinder date. But sometimes I get true crime overload, which leads me to setting up booby traps around my apartment, like I'm Kevin McAllister, self-medicating with wine, and struggling with falling asleep. I'm so glad that we talk about therapy so much in this community, and I've learned so much about cognitive behavior therapy from the work I've done and how I can use those tools to calm down when my mind is racing or imagining there could be a serial killer hiding in my closet. We've been using this great app, Nuna, that uses CBT methods in this cool chat function, which helps me get a hold of my thoughts and feel like a friend is helping talk me back to a more reasonable state of mind. You can try Nuna right now to help with your mental well-being and get 25% off when you use our link to sign up. Just go to landing.nuna.ai slash MMN or just click on the link in our show notes for your 25% discount. Let Nuna help convince you that the noise you heard outside your door is probably just your cat up to their usual hijinks. Yeah. 
and we're back. By all accounts, Joseph Smith was a troubled little boy. The Smiths and their friends at church described a rambunctious kid, a bit inappropriate at times. Sometimes he wasn't into all the prayer sessions his family carried out each day. Sometimes he pushed things a little too far by acting satanic, according to the family. Things like referring to himself as, quote, legion. Legion, according to Wikipedia, is a demon or a group of demons, particularly those in the Gerasene demoniac which is the story in the New Testament wherein Jesus performs an exorcism. So yeah, that's a little dark. Joseph also made violent threats against his siblings, particularly his two-year-old brother. We all knew obnoxious, rage-filled kids growing up. From our perspective today, it sounds like Joseph might have had ADHD or been otherwise neurodivergent. He also may have been dealing with some mental health issues. The problem is the Remnant Fellowship shuns psychiatry and has a particular disdain for medication. When Joseph Sr. and Sonia Smith began to struggle with parenting Joseph, they should have sought professional help for their son. Instead, they went to the church for advice. The church advised them to punish Joseph when he acted up. By the sounds of things, even if Joseph was crying unnecessarily, he would be punished for it. There's an audio recording of a Remnant Fellowship women's group meeting where Sonia Smith and Gwen Shamlin Lara discuss Joseph's punishment. Sonia tells Gwen that she took everything out of Joseph's bedroom and locked him in there with nothing but a Bible from Friday to Sunday. And when he came out, he was quiet. Gwen responded by declaring it a miracle. Then she said, you've got a child going from bizarre to in control. So praise God. When Gwen Shamblin Lara denied that the punishments that the church praises have ever escalated to the level of abuse, I think she was speaking about the average remnant fellowship family. She has said things like, usually after being spanked properly, the child is obedient and you don't have to spank them again. In interviews, Shamblin has denied ever using glue sticks, but admitted to spanking her kids with a wooden spoon. In our opinion, all the above constitutes abuse, so there's no escalation necessary. On October 8, 2003, Joseph was eight years old. According to the father, Joseph Smith, the family gathered in the kitchen that day to participate in an online prayer session with the Remnant Fellowship Church. Mr. Smith says that his son suddenly collapsed during that prayer session. Young Joseph was, quote, warm to the touch, wet with sweat, and unresponsive, according to his father. He picked up the boy and carried him out to the carport, He has said that he believed his son was overheating and thought that laying him on the cold concrete might cool him down. It did not. This is when the Smiths called 911. According to a policeman on the scene, Joseph Smith greeted them saying, quote, I'm not going to lie to you. He's bruised. Cobb County Fire and Rescue found the child lying on his back in the dining room, not breathing and without a pulse. He was rushed to the hospital where doctors determined that Joseph was brain dead. One day later, Joseph died. The Cobb County Medical Examiner came to the conclusion that Joseph Smith died because of acute and chronic abuse. The Smiths also insisted that Joseph's punishments never rose to the level of abuse, though they did admit to hitting him with glue sticks, which is of course abuse. Sonia and Joseph Smith were arrested in December of 2003. They spent just four months in jail before the Remnant Fellowship bailed them out. Gwen Shamblin said in an interview that the church's members have decided to collectively foot all of the Smith's legal bills. Gwen Shamblin Lara so vehemently denied advocating for abuse that it would seem logical to excommunicate the Smiths after they were formally charged with abuse and murder. Instead, the church fiercely defended the couple who were very well liked in the Remnant Fellowship community, even today. Messages on Facebook proclaiming love and support for Joseph and Sonia Smith flood the comments section of all their photos. According to an ex-member on Reddit, no one person was concerned with praying for little Joseph's soul. They only cared about getting his parents out of trouble. I do want to note that if you have any doubts that Gwen was lying when she said she does not advocate for abusing children and none of the punishments she is aware of have ever escalated to abuse, we have a couple of revealing examples to share. 
In one instance, another remnant leader named David Martin talked about one night where he had to spank his two and a half year old daughter over and over and over again. As Gwen Shamlin described it, David Martin had a real showdown. It was a one night showdown and that child never forgot it. Ex-remnant follower Terry Phillips recalled an hour-long spanking session that took place because her five-year-old daughter was crying. She described, quote, spanking, trying to see if she would stop crying. And if she did not stop crying, another remnant follower would tell Terry to spank her harder. Here's a member testimony from the Remnant Fellowship website. I was hesitant and sometimes refused to properly discipline my child because I didn't want to hurt them or have them hate me. Now I discipline my child in order to save them from hell rather than being concerned about their flesh. Shamlin tells her followers not to worry about the effect on children's self-esteem, but to worry about more what she calls their God esteem. Gwen claims that extended spanking sessions are extremely rare and only occur when the child is strong-willed, which she believes to be a negative trait. During the trial, prosecutors described the abuse of Joseph Smith in greater detail. They claimed the Smiths frequently locked their son in a wooden box or confined him to a locked closet for hours at a time. Police reported that Joseph and Sonia would lock their child in his bedroom or closet for days and even weeks with only a bucket for a toilet. Mrs. Smith told the police that she normally gave the children their whippings in increments of 10 blows and that her son Joseph had injured several whipping sessions on that day that they called 911. Police also said that siblings would sometimes hold Joseph down while his parents beat him with implements. Testimony from Joseph's brother, Michael, actually corroborated the prosecution's account of the events of October 8th. Michael said that Joseph was acting out while the family watched a broadcast from the Remnant Fellowship Church. Michael explained that his brother was, quote, screaming, cursing, and carrying on. His parents asked him to put Joseph inside a wood-lined chest. He tied the lid closed with an extension cord because Joseph kept, quote, popping his head up. Michael testified that while inside the box, Joseph only continued to scream. Allegedly, Joseph yelled, I'm going to kill all of you motherfuckers when I get out. James is the first one on my list. I'm going to slit his throat. James was Joseph's two-year-old brother. 10 to 15 minutes later, Joseph stopped yelling, so Michael cut the extension cord to free him from the chest. Unfortunately, it was too late, and Joseph was already unresponsive. Michael Smith also confirmed accusations that his parents regularly disciplined their son by whipping him with glue sticks, belts, and heated coat hangers. Yeah. He said that they would lock the boy in confined spaces for extended periods of time, tying his hands with rope. The Smith's defense attorney, hired by the Remnant Fellowship Church, had a completely different story to explain Joseph's death. The defense suggested that Joseph's injuries were consistent with his history of eczema. They explained that any bruises and cuts found on his body were caused by his incessant scratching at his itchy skin condition. The defense alleged that Joseph died as a result of a staph infection, which they also say came about because he had been scratching at his skin and those scratches became infected. To their credit, Joseph's blood came back gram positive for staph bacteria, and he was found to have a low white blood cell count and a high fever. The defense cried injustice, stating that the medical examiner didn't perform tests that could have cleared this mess. CAT scans at the hospital did not indicate any concussion, skull fracture, or internal hemorrhaging, which the defense says shows that Joseph did not die as a result of abuse. Eleanor Odom, the assistant DA in Cobb County, said that Joseph's injuries were some of the worst she had ever seen. Lead detective on the case, David Schweitzer, noted in the HBO Max docuseries that Joseph was the second Smith child to die within 11 weeks. 17-month-old Malek was alleged to have died of sudden infant death syndrome in July of 2003. And Schweitzer said on the show that he wishes he had dug deeper into that situation. All 12 members of the jury unanimously agreed that Joseph and Sonia Smith were guilty during this week in true crime history on February 16, 2007, which coincidentally would have been Joseph's 12th birthday. 
Joseph would have celebrated his 26th birthday this week if he were still alive. The Smiths were convicted of 11 counts, including felony murder, reckless conduct, false imprisonment, aggravated assault, and cruelty to children. On March 27, 2007, they were sentenced to life plus 30 years in prison, which is the maximum sentence. Joseph and Sonia Smith both made unsuccessful appeals in the coming years. They complained of ineffective counsel from the defense attorneys, even though those attorneys were provided by the church. A petition was filed in 2011 asking the Supreme Court to review decisions made in lower courts, and that petition was later denied. The Remnant Fellowship Church has continued to support the Smiths and defend their alleged innocence. They bought the domain thesmithsareinnocent.com, where a long diatribe regurgitates ideas put forth by the defense during the trial. They also bought thesmithsareguilty.com, which for a long period would redirect to thesmithsareinnocent.com. On May 29, 2021, seven Remnant Fellowship Church leaders, including Gwen Shamblin Lara, her husband Joe Lara, and her son in law, Brandon Hanna, boarded Gwen's private jet, a 1982 Cessna 501 citation. All occupants of the jet were killed when it crashed near Smyrna, Tennessee, shortly after takeoff. The jet made impact in a shallow area of Percy Priest Lake, which was between two and eight feet deep. It remains uncertain who was flying their plane, but there were two pilots aboard, including Joe Lara. According to pilot certification records, neither pilot held the necessary certification to fly this type of jet. Some reports after the crash have concluded that the pilot could only have been Lara. The group was on their way to a mega rally in Florida at the height of the pandemic, I might add, which really underlines their backwards beliefs, if you ask us. Gwen Chamblin Lara was 66 years old, and Joe Lara was 58 at the time of the crash. Reportedly, Gwen, who made millions from her diet program turned cult, didn't leave a dime to the Remnant Fellowship in her will. Elizabeth Chamblin Hanna, who lost her mother, her stepfather, and her husband in the crash, has now taken the reins of the Remnant Fellowship Church. It is Elizabeth's intent to, quote, continue the dream that Gwen Shamlin Lara has of helping people find a relationship with God. That means this cult horror story is not over yet. Any group that promotes abuse against children will continue to be confronted with traumatized adults who only perpetuate the cycle of abuse. Cults like the Remnant Fellowship encourage physical, sexual, and emotional abuse, and yet nothing can shut them down until things escalate to the level of murder. In this case, apparently, the murder of one or possibly two children is not enough to deter followers. The church and its leaders have never been held responsible for advising members to carry out violently abusive behaviors. At this point, I would like to reiterate something that we have talked about on previous episodes of the podcast. It's often difficult to determine whether you or someone you love is involved with a dangerous cult. Some important signifiers that the so-called church that you go to might actually be a cult include that the leader of the group claims to be any type of prophet or messiah, that the group claims to be the one true church and proclaims all other religions to be phony. If you or someone you love is being deprived of food or sleep in the name of religion, if members are coerced to cut ties with any friends or family who do not subscribe to the same system of beliefs, if some or several members move out of their homes to live on a church compound or to live in group settings with other members of the church, if the group operates under a structure of hierarchy and subservience, or if the group speaks negatively about anyone who decides to leave, or if any ex-members refer to the group as a cult, then you may be dealing with a dangerous cult. In case you or someone you know needs help escaping a cult, we will put some valuable resources in the show notes for today's episode. Oh, I feel like that's one of the worst cults I've ever heard of. Like, just terrible. Yeah, it's, it's horrific. It's like a child abuse factory. Yeah. And uh, it brings a a lot of things to question in my mind because it's like uh, when we look at 
a lot of popular true crime cases, I mean, most of them are um, somebody willfully committing an act against another person. Mm -hmm. Uh, When it comes to instructing or inspiring other people to do things, it gets a bit fuzzy. Um, I know there was that one case, I forget what the woman's name was, but she had been texting her boyfriend telling him to kill himself, and then he did. uh, Do Um, you remember that case? Yeah, Michelle, what's her name? Michelle something. Yeah. I think the, the, there was a movie about this called like, I love you now die. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, things like that. Like in this case, she obviously um, faced some trouble because of telling her boyfriend to kill himself right. when he did. But if you tell someone to um, murder someone, it still gets fuzzy because it's like, are you being manipulated? Are you a victim yourself? And in this situation, they're not outright saying murder people, but they're saying, go ahead and beat your children, which I guess the ultimate um, act is up to the parents. But uh, I don't know, it really gets sticky when all this brainwashing stuff is involved. Yeah, um, I agree. It's it's just really upsetting. And it's like as if the fat phobia wasn't bad enough, then we have sponsored child abuse. And you know, like it reminds me on a much wider scale of the case that we covered for one of our Patreon episodes of Aurora Gagnon um, yeah, and like same. the horrific things her parents did for her saying yeah. she was a bad kid and that she, yeah. you know, like was anti-religious and whatever. And like- It was so the, similar. And that yeah. the siblings would hold her down yeah. and that they used heated coat hangers. I don't know how you can heat up a coat hanger and not think in your mind that you're committing abuse. It's <laughs> like that's- just terrible. Mm. Poor thing. Despicable. Yeah. So have you started watching Inventing Anna yet? Um, I have. I think I'm on the second episode and I've been watching it a bit slow. It's so great, but uh, I'm yeah. waiting for my husband to watch it because he's really into it too. <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> it's really fun though. And I'm I'm really enjoying the show. And I'm uh, the girl um, from Ozark, her yeah. name's Julia Garner. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Um, I only know so her good. as Ruth. <laughs> yeah. She's so good in this uh, in this series. She just like her, her strange uh, Anna Delvey accent. Yes. <laughs> and like, it's amazing. It's very and, Moira uh, Rose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very random. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a really um, uh, interesting story, which for any of you who aren't familiar is, um, it's a story of Anna Delvey who, uh, I guess, posed as a wealthy heiress, but she actually didn't have any money. And uh, she was so successful with this act that she, um, scammed friends and banks and hotels out of uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, right. um, just just pretending that she had the the money to pay them back. So she certainly led an interesting life and uh, is now in jail, continuing to be interesting. <laughs> so yeah, for definitely sure. recommend the show. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's really good, at least so far. <laughs> mm-hmm. You watching anything else uh, on the crime front? Yeah, I watched um, a few things this past week that were true crimey. One that's not, like not necessarily true crimey, but maybe a recommendation for people that really enjoyed Yellow Jackets. Um, mm. It's uh, I, I've seen it recommended in many groups, including Yellow Jacket specific groups. It's called The Wilds. Mm. And it's wow. about a group of girls that's in a plane crash. It's on Amazon Prime streaming. And huh. um, it's like very different like concept from Yellow Jackets. And I don't want to okay. like say too much about what's going on in the background because you don't find out right away. And it's quite the <gasps> plot twist. But like, it's uh. not what you think, like for sure. It's not just as simple as a plane crash, but it's really good. Wow. And, um, you know, quite good, like, interesting feminist message. It's very, huh. very, it's a, you'll definitely watch it in like a day or two. I promise. It's very, that's good. amazing. I've never heard of it, but I will, uh, immediately start on that. Yeah, <laughs> it's and it's cool. on Amazon. So, um, if you have prime, it's, you know, very easy to access. Awesome. So that one was good. It's, it's certainly not yellow jackets. I just don't think I could love anything as much as I love no, that show. Like it hit all so the notes good. for me, but, um, it's yeah. very good. And the other thing that I watched, which I think is on HBO, is The Girl Before, um, which is based Mm -hmm. on a book that I read Mm -hmm. years ago that's kind of 
in the same family of thrillers. I've heard it compared to like Girl on a Train or um, mm. like Gone Girl kinds of things. And yeah, it's like about this woman who's moved into this like magnificent architectural like feat of an apartment, but the guy that designed it and owns it is a bit of a like control freak. Like he wants whoever lives in the apartment to keep it exactly as is. He doesn't want rugs or paintings to go up. He doesn't want clutter. Mm. He doesn't want like anything added to it. And he wants that person to Typical like landlord. <laughs> yeah, honestly, right? I don't know if that's like any different from how the rest of us live. You're right. <laughs> Valid point. <laughs> um, and then like the girl starts to discover that she has a lot of similarities between a woman that lived there not long before her that was mm. died accidentally, but was it murder? <laughs> mm. <laughs> Very intriguing. So the show's great. I think it's like only four episodes. So it's kind of a quick watch. Um, what was it called again? It's called The Girl Before. Oh, okay, right. Cool. And I awesome. really liked the book. Um, I saw like in some group, like in a group discussing the show that like a lot of people hated the book and thought it was just terrible. Like maybe I just have Oof. bad taste. I don't know. I was like, I read it in a couple of days. I was quite like huh. grabbed by the plot. I thought it was very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. But the TV show, it's a little bit like soapy for sure. Like it's not mm. like a super serious thriller, but um, it's very mm. watchable and it's it's just great. The, you know, the actors Amazing. are all great in it too. Awesome. Uh, I watched a couple other things worth mentioning, I guess. One is, of course, um, The Way Down, which I haven't finished. Mm. Um, so just to be clear, um, the... Uh, the program that Gwen Shamblin ran was called The Way Down, um, with way as in how much you weigh. Um, the program on HBO Max is called The Way Down, like W-A-Y, um, which I got to say, like, after <laughs> after the plane crash happened, it's like there's a, there's a really dark joke in there that I don't want to be the one to tell, hmm. I guess, <laughs> with the title. <laughs> but it's like, um, oh, yeah. yeah, but the, the interesting thing is... Um, they started making the show before the plane crash. The plane crash actually happened like just a few days before they wrapped. Wow. Um, so it changed the whole subject basically. Yeah. But at first there's like interviews and everything. I haven't gotten to the end, but I, I'm interested to watch how this unfolds as things, you know, inevitably happen. Right. Um, but uh, I also watched something that just seemed interestingly familiar to uh, this story. It, it was a movie called The Clofitch Killer, which is on Netflix. Um, it recently came out. Um, it's sort of like a, a, I guess, a thriller movie about a killer, obviously. Um, but the the similar points are, this is taking place in a uh, really evangelical community. There's a lot of weird Christian repression that results in some unsavory things. Um, there's a lot of denial. Mm. Uh, it's just, uh, it really touches on a lot of similar points um, to, you know, the the remnant fellowship cult and uh, how things went down there. So, I mean, we can just picture a million different ways this can pan out. And the Bible Belt is a large geographical area where these things could just right. be happening under wraps all the time. Absolutely. So it, it's, it's very concerning. For sure. Well, I guess that's enough murder for one week. But if I have misjudged your capacity for creepy murder stories, you can find plenty of others on MurderMurder.News, where we post the latest in true crime news every day of the week. You can also find us on Instagram at Murder Murder News, where this week we posted a couple of solid Valentine themed memes. Definitely go check out that uh, yeah. James Cook one. It's great. Yes. <laughs> you can find us on Twitter at mm Murder News, mm. where you can find your next favorite podcast and one of our follow Friday tweets. You can find us on TikTok at Murder Murder News, where those missing person posts just aren't hitting like they should lately. So please find us on TikTok and help us spread the word by interacting on our posts. It really helps get them boosted so these people can be seen and maybe somebody can help find them. And maybe we can help bring some of these people home. You can find us on Facebook uh, and you can just search for Murder Murder News to find our page. And while you're on Facebook searching for Murder Murder News, you'll also see our little group pop up. You'll want to make sure you're a member if you enjoy things like live virtual events and meeting new spooky friends for book club. 
We're currently reading We Keep the Dead Close by Becky Cooper, which I'm really enjoying. I'm listening to the audiobook, which is narrated by Becky Cooper herself. We meet on Sunday, February 27th on Zoom, which means you still have plenty of time to get reading. Please, please leave us a little review if you like our show. Give us a five star on Apple Podcasts if you like what you're hearing. See you next week, friends. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> 